my name's Jason Mark, and it's just M-A-R-K. I'm born in 1975 and came to the Bay Area in June of 1997, which is a really exciting time. I, I remember um, watching the, the massive critical masses at the time and thinking, this is exactly where I want to be. Um, and with the exception of a two-year sojourn on an organic farm in Santa Cruz, I've been San Francisco, Oakland, back and forth uh, for the last 12 years. Um, well, I came from Phoenix, Arizona, and went to school back east, and realized I didn't want to stay in the east. It just felt kind of um, really closed and uh, ossified, and wanted to come west, but didn't want to go to, back to Arizona. And so if you're from Arizona, California's a big city. Um, and, you know, you can really tell a lot about Arizonans, whether they go to Los Angeles or San Francisco, right? It's Some people go to Los Angeles, and some people go to San Francisco, and I was one of those who came to the Bay. Um, I came here because I got an internship at the San Francisco Bay Guardian, and so sort of cut my teeth, um, learning a lot from Tim Redman and Bruce Brugman, uh, certainly how to write and report, but also um, just deepening my sense of, of progressive politics. Um, then I worked for a little shy of a year for a podunk paper called the Martinez News Gazette, um, which was really great, and I covered the environmental beat out there. So I was covering Chevron and Shell and uh, Valero and Exxon and the, the heavy industries, Ron Polanc, the chemical companies out there, and what's the you know second most industrialized county in the state of California. Uh, and got just kind of a little fed up with the strictures of... of objective journalism. You know, I would have loved to have stayed at The Guardian, but that wasn't really in the cards as a 23-year-old then. Um, and, you know, I had a great editor, but I just, and she was super supportive of me. Um, but I would, we would get calls from the shell, the flax at Shell, saying, oh, this story Jason did really sucks, and, you know, I want a correction. And Anne was great. She always stood by me, but it was just, I decided to go do other things. And so I was really lucky to end up uh, at the Human Rights Group Global Exchange, where I spent six years as the communications director, four years as the communications director, and then a couple of years um, running a nationwide campaign to break America's oil addiction, which is still sort of a work in progress. Yeah, that was uh, not for lack of trying, but no, not really. I mean, again, I, I got sort of involved in progressive politics. I got radicalized by a couple of uh, college professors, like I think a lot of, you know, a lot of middle class kids do, um, or some, some at Georgetown University. Um, and got radicalized by some college professors, but, but started out, I mean, really cut my teeth as a social justice organizer, you know, working at Global Exchange with Medea Benjamin and Kevin Danaher running aggressive campaigns against Gap sweatshops and Nike sweatshops, shutting down the WTO in Seattle in 1999. And that's, that's how I cut my teeth. We started the, our Freedom From Oil campaign um, as an anti-war campaign. We said, okay, let's take the No Blood For Oil slogan but every, you know, we've got tens of thousands of people in, in uh, you know, the spring of 2003 marching across the country, and many of them carrying signs that said no blood for oil. So, well, let's actually put some meat on the bones here. Let's follow back the money. Okay, so if one of the major reasons that the U.S. military has got 150,000 or now 135,000 troops in Iraq is because, it, because of the petroleum reserves there in that region, then let's get us off of the oil. And the way to get us off the oil is not to keep banging our hands against uh, our heads against Chevron and Exxon it's to go to the auto companies and say you you know you're the ones who are keeping us hooked on this stuff go build vehicles that don't run on petroleum um, and so my ecological activism really came from a from an anti-militarist standpoint or from a you know a, a peace and social justice standpoint that's really how we we looked at it there at global exchange I got I would say into environmental ecological activism because in the course of running this campaign against oil companies, I started to read up on the peak oil literature, on the climate change literature, and got really scared, you know, quite frankly, about how we're running into the limits of, of the finite resources on this planet. Um, and so in a sense, sort of dropped out and went and lived on an organic farm um, for a year and a half and, and learned how to, how to be a, a vegetable, organic vegetable grower and then brought those skills back here to the city. But I mean, I, I don't look at, I, I think that ecological sustainability is the social justice issue of the 21st century. That we're not gonna be able to, that if we wanna ensure that everybody's got a fair and basic decent standard of living, 
and clean water and healthy food and clothes on their back and a shelter over their heads, that that's an ecological effort at this point. With 6.5 billion people on the planet, uh, diminishing fresh water supplies, ecosystems in collapse. And so, you know, I love to go backpacking and I love to hang out in the wilderness and I love hanging out here in the garden three days a week. And I have this sort of like innate biophilia that I think drives a lot of environmental activists. But, you know, emotionally and intellectually, I, th I, I do ecological activism as a social justice campaign, as a social justice crusade. The road in front of our house is a dirt road, and now that's a quarter of a mile from a major freeway exit. So I spent, you know, like a lot of little kids, I spent my afternoons and my summers running around in the wilderness, which in Arizona means the desert. So riding dirt bikes around and looking for horny toads and looking for snakes and, you know, looking for fool's gold, and that's just kind of how it went um, and you know was lucky enough to get to spend summers at a summer camp up in the woods in northern Arizona and so I do think I have this sort of I mean I do think that most people have kind of you know again what E.O. Wilson calls you know biophilia like when I'm out here at the garden it uh, fulfills me in a way that environmental journalism doesn't and I'm very proud of the work of the writing I've done as a journalist and an author, but there's something that's just more tangible and more real and like real in the realest sense. I mean, like you, um, I, I think what's so exciting about the urban food movement or the sustainable food movement is that, you know, Michael Pollan says if we could just get everybody um, to grow a little bit of their food. And yeah, that's a, there's sort of a, a political element there around sustainability and, and sustainable food systems. But I also think if everybody was growing a little bit of their own food, they would be so much more tapped in to natural systems because when you start to grow your own food you become by necessity a meteorologist and a hydrologist and a botanist and an etymologist. I mean, you have to start paying attention to all these things that we don't otherwise do. My girlfriend jokes about how often I'm checking the weather online because I kind of want to match up my real lived physical experience with whatever the meteorologists are telling me was in fact the temperature today, yesterday, tomorrow. Um, as, as well as the wind speed and, and this sort of stuff. I mean, it's like, and I'm just kind of grounded in it. You know, I was really lucky that, you know, my parents had the, had the means to send us to summer camp for four summers in a row in, in Northern Arizona. And it was run by, you know, generally some like real old cowboys. I mean, the guy who started it was actually like an Arizona cowboy from the, you know, teens and 20s, who by then, you know, in the 1980s was in his 80s. Um, and there was a big premium there on what I would kind of call like Teddy Roosevelt meat and potatoes conservationism, right? I mean, it, the, we learned how to make a fire using flints and how to lay a fire. Um, it was a horse camp, right? I mean, you spent like four days a week riding. And there was the usual like ceramics and painting and drama and water skiing and all that sort of stuff. But it was, you know, you know, I don't know what like a you know, summer camp experiences like in the Catskills. But I mean, it was, it was Northern Arizona and that was clear in the kind of summer camp experience. I mean, we would, you know, we would take pack mules like out up into the woods uh, with, you know, Dutch ovens and, you know, kind of live for three days with, you know, some 20 year old counselor who didn't really know much more than we did. Um, so that was the kind of environmental education that I got. Although I do, you know, what was a really big experience for me was Earth Day 1990, the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. And I remember that, that, and you remember it came on the heels of the Exxon Valdez spill. Um, and I remember that being really big. And my parents who are not especially progressive, they're liberal-minded people, but they're not, they're not activists, they're not radicals by any means. Um, I remember them taking us down to the Arizona State Capitol where there was a big Earth Day event. Um, and that was kind of like a big deal. I mean, that was sort of the first time I was, I guess, I was 15 years old, the environment really hit me. My first environmental campaign was convincing my mother to go off of paper napkins and go to cloth napkins. And I won that campaign. The, the Bay Area organization, environmental organization I had the most contact with was Communities for a Better Environment because I was covering the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors. And one of their main, you know, aside from zoning and, you know, uh, you know, maybe... You know, the, the big environmental issues in Contra Costa County are the refineries and sprawl development. So it was, you know, Greenbelt Alliance, Tom Moores was there at the time, um, Communities for a Better Environment, Denny Larson was at the helm then in, in 97, 98. 
Um, and I, you know, self-consciously was trying to build relationships with those guys to, to have them as sources. Um, I remember writing a story about, like, the CBE Bucket Brigade, where they were getting communities in Point Richmond, uh, Crockett, Martinez, to go out and take, you know, air samples. Um, definitely Critical Mass in 97 was huge. You know, I remember, you know, the kind of face-off between Willie Brown and Critical Mass in 97, and that was really exciting. I mean, I didn't... Did I have a bike? Oh, yeah, I brought a bike from Washington, D.C. Uh, but I, I experienced the first critical mass, like, on TV. Like, I had literally been in the Bay probably, like, a week. Um, maybe three weeks when there was the big one in, in June of 97. And thinking, wow, this is really cool. This is... It really sort of affirmed my sense of wanting to be in the Bay Area. Um, and then, of course, working at The Guardian, you get a... Uh, a crash course is one way of putting it in, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, the corporate monster that is PG&E. I mean, you know, Bruce and, and Tim hammer that in, like, pretty clearly. Uh, and so that helped get a little bit of the, you know, lay of the land. But I had to backfill. Like, I remember um, there was another intern. We, we were watching some film about the International Hotel and the fight around the International Hotel. And one of the other interns mentioned... Dan White in a Twinkie, de Twinkie defense. And I didn't know what that was. I was grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And I think any kid in, you know, in the Bay would have heard a little bit about the Harvey Milk, Dan White thing. But that was kind of news for me. So I had, I had to backfill not only, I think, on... Um, I had a pretty good grounding in, in, like, U.S. sort of progressive history or ecological history. But for the Bay Area, I had to sort of backfill a lot of that. That is my sense of how that functions. I mean, I know Mike Rozelle a little bit, you know, of, of, in passing. Um... My sense is, yes, that was a deliberate attempt to uh, create more of an edge in the environmental movement. That was and is badly needed. I'm, you know, I'm definitely, um, when it comes to tactics, you know, small C Catholic. Like, whatever works, works. Um, I think there's a space for the attorneys of the NRDC and the policy wonks in the Sierra Club just as we need Mike Rozelle out there, you know, doing a tree sit uh, against mountaintop removal. Um, or the people at Rainforest Action Network doing a little of both. I mean, I think we need that kind of ecumenical sense of what's going on. I do remember, though, I mean, I was certainly very involved in the, the plans to shut down the World Trade Organization meetings in Seattle of 1999. And, you know, the Seattle organizers, the national organizers, you know, came to the Bay Area people and said, we need you guys to bring 10,000 people up there to Seattle. And we, like, knew that that was a goal. We need to bring 10,000 people to the, from the Bay Area because this was um, such a kind of just a rich hotbed of environmental and social justice labor activism. Um, there was a lot of... I definitely got caught very much in the middle of, of what you could call progressive left kind of sectarians and backbiting because... Uh, you know, Medea Benjamin made a careless comment uh, the morning after uh, the main shutdown in, in Seattle saying, oh, those anarchists should have been arrested after the windows at the Nike town got broken. So that was kind of a, a, a baptism by fire because, you know, I was having to work with Medea and crafting responses. I went to The Guardian and went to places like Counterpunch. And um, it was definitely baptism by fire and, and thinking about... Uh, um, how do you balance more radical tactics against against others? But I think I even got that experience again within three weeks of moving to San Francisco watching Critical Mass, where that was, you know, widely celebrated and widely reviled, and probably any number of places in between people saying, well, I kind of don't get it. You know, I've since written in, in Critical Mass more times than I know, and like any Critical Mass writer, I've had my fair share of conversations with motorists, some of which have been very polite and and fascinating really I mean just like wonderful conversations and others that have been probably not that productive um, so but I guess to answer the question yeah I have I've long been cognizant that you know for the environmental movement to succeed or for any movement to succeed you need a, a broad range of, of screamers shouters compromisers um, lawyers organizers, writers, etc. You need all hands on deck. Well, I think what's super interesting is even just in, let's say, the 
the 12 years in which I've been a, you know, worn different hats as a professional writer and a, and a, and a professional, you know, campaigner is the real shift and and maybe the Obama administration, Obama administration is trying to move it back a little bit. I don't know, but is a real shift from looking and relying on the the federal government to make change, and then looking at the business community to make change. And I think that's really more most obvious in the environmental movement than in any other movement on the progressive left, right? Because the idea is we're not going to get out of this ecological mess unless businesses step up to make the investments in a new kind of economy. So the most obvious example, right, is all of the hullabaloo around green tech and the, the venture capital money that's moving into solar, wind. I think the environmental movement, more than, say, the, you know, compatriots in the labor movement or the queer rights movement, look at business as the solution to the problem. Um, not in like a crass kind of invisible hand way, but more in a way that is saying if we're going to make this wholesale like, you know, shift in our energy production or in our in our transportation models, that the people who are going to be able to do that is going to be Ford Motor Company and the Silicon Valley venture capitalists. I think you even see that. I mean, you know, prominent leaders like Al Gore. Sure, Al Gore is in a super valuable, playing a very valuable role in being out on the hustings as a public educator. But unless I'm wrong, he makes his money by being a consultant to a major venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley that's involved in clean tech, you know. And so that Gore is almost like a great example of that, right? He's kind of playing both sides. Yes, he's certainly through Repower America trying to get the federal government to pass aggressive climate and energy legislation, and he's got his kind of toehold in uh, in the business world. So that's the biggest change that I've seen is this sort of sense that okay, we're well, gonna you know. The federal government's going to have to take charge of this and, and more of an emphasis about green business, which is, I think, where a lot of the buzz in the energy is. Well, I mean, if you want to go, like, way back, I mean, I think you, you know, somebody like a Thoreau in his day was the progressive left, right? You know, uh, an abolitionist, radical, you know, writing and, and acting about, you know, performing civil disobedience. But then, you know, from, from arguably, you know, Teddy Roosevelt through the Wilderness Act 1964, the environmental movement in this country was conservative, very much so. Um, you know, I've been told, though I don't know this for a fact, that David Brower in 1960 voted for Nixon. And so it seems like you didn't really have the movement from a conservative conservationist movement to a more, like, liberally-minded environmentalist movement. Really, it was, like, 1969, right? The oil spill off Santa Barbara, the, you know, river in Cleveland catching on fire, Earth Day... Um, and that was sort of a shift, and I think partially because it was so, you know, there's a great, if you read the Bill McKibben anthology, American Earth, and, and one of the pieces in there is a um, New York Times dispatch from Earth Day 1970 Manhattan. It's Woodstock, right? I mean, it's like, that's how it reads like. It was definitely, a, from my reading of it, and again, I wasn't there, but it's a kind of a hippie, countercultural, quasi-utopian phenomenon. So, in that sense, maybe it's not progressive left labor, but it's it's countercultural, and it's like, contrarian of the mainstream it seems the environmental the environmental movement you know has always been a little waspy you know it's, and so it's not really surprising that the environmental movement would put such a great faith in in investors bankers and, and lawyers i think cities are gonna have to be i think cities are a huge part of how we can find a more sustainable way of living um the suburbs don't work, right? The suburbs are broken. They're cultural. I, I think of myself really as a refugee from the suburbs. I mean, I just had to get out of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it's alienating. I mean, it is pure alienation being in these, you know, being in an automobile, driving around on giant boulevards and freeways, little to no human contact through the course of your day. Um, and they're not sustainable just in terms of their overall ecological footprint on how reliant they are on, on fossil fuels. Um, it's going to be some sort of mix of new urbanism or urban centers that that I think is going to be the way to live more sustainably. Um, just because we're closer to each other, closer to each other geographically, closer to each other emotionally in our day-to-day -day lives, and hopefully the goods and services that we need then don't have to travel so far. Or once they travel far, they're easily distributed. So I think cities are you know, a wonderful model of sustainability. And... Um, you know, you hear this stat that, that the city of Hong Kong produces 50% of its own eggs. 
I mean, that's kind of unreal to think about. Um, and sure, there's some islands out there in Hong Kong. It's not like it's amid all the high rises. But those are the models, right? Or something like Alamany Farm here, where we're at least providing a glimpse of how we could grow more of our food in urban places, um, pedestrian-friendly neighborhoods, bicycling-friendly neighborhoods, mass transit-friendly neighborhoods. Um, this is sort of the fabric I think we need to sustain ourselves. And then finding linkages to the rural communities that are going to provide or help provide essential goods, most obviously food, but also um, timber, lumber, you know, other ecological assets, for example, fresh water. I mean, but yes, I think the, the um, ecotopia vision, if you want to kind of go there, looks a lot more like San Francisco or even Berkeley than it does um, Walnut Creek or Dublin Pleasanton. And or the Central Valley. Or the Central Valley. So I have a lot of you know, hope for cities as the places where um, we're creating the solutions. And I think it's, and, and that just goes to show again how intimately ecological sustainability is related to community. Um, that you can't separate the two. And that's why I think is the city's greatest assets because it's easier to knit community in a place where you're more likely to run, just by geography, just by chance, I'm more likely to run into you in a place like San Francisco than I would be in Dublin Pleasant because we're both going to be in our cars. If we run into each other, that involves the insurance companies, right? So this, this parcel, Alamany Farm, was created as an urban farm about 12 years ago by a group called San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners, which unfortunately collapsed in... 2003, and the land was basically abandoned for a number of years until uh, a guy named Antonio Roman Alcala and his, and his buddies came in as guerrilla gardeners in the spring of 05 and got it restarted. I got plugged in a little bit after that in like July of 05, and Antonio and I started working to revitalize this place. Um, four years later, it's a, it's a thriving organic market garden, um, and I think among the examples of of urban food cultivation, you know, I mean, I think we're definitely can proudly stand among like Milwaukee's, uh, um, uh, you know, farms of Chicago or Philadelphia, or other places. We're growing in the middle of the season right now about two to three hundred pounds of produce a week. About half of that goes to our volunteers that come out here every weekend and work and help maintain the garden. The other half is distributed to 25 families in the uh, adjacent public housing community who um, get a, a bag of fresh fruits and vegetables every week. And again, I think the farm also, I mean, for, a, for, you know, for about a year and a half, we had some grant funding. But for much of the last four years, it's been entirely volunteer run. And again, that's another example of community in action, community in the making, right? Um, yes, we need a little bit of money to pay for seeds and starts, but it's, it's chump change. It's a couple thousand dollars a year. Everything else out here is people power, and it's, it's just community in action. Everything you see here was done by volunteers, digging beds, planting plants, Weeding them, watering them, harvesting them, maintaining them, etc. And you know, it can sound kind of saccharine, but I mean, sometimes I look around here on a weekend, and it really does feel like you know we're kind of living the dream. It is ethnically diverse. It's um, age diverse. You know, we've got toddlers to uh, you know old timers in their 70s and 80s. Um, and that's kind of what it's about. I mean, in any community garden, the community comes before the garden, and that's what we're trying to do here. Well, the deep paving's not going to quite work because the asphalt is water permeable, and it's pretty much poisoned everything beneath it for the foreseeable future. But the sidewalks are fine. Concrete's just a cap, right? So that soil underneath there has certainly been abused. The soil underneath concrete's been abused, but with some love and TLC and attention and, and the right stewardship, it can be restored. Um, you just have to take off that cap, start working it, and expose it again to sunlight, air, fungi, water, and you'll bring it back to life. Asphalt, though, is toxic, and there's all sorts of nasty stuff and in an ENE, you know, petroleum byproducts, gasoline byproducts, that's... I mean, I always think the, the crazy thing about asphalt, right, is we're taking petroleum to make the roads, to run the cars, to over the petroleum. I mean, you know, it's sort of insane, but yes, there is so much space here in San Francisco even without unpaving anything to grow our own food. And, and cities, I mean, cities are never going to be food self-sufficient, right? We don't have enough land and space here um, to grow wheat for ourselves, much less pasture-raised goats. Um, 
But what happens, again, by growing some of our food, not only do we, again, do we cultivate that ecological consciousness by getting people more uh, aware of their surroundings and our reliance on natural systems, but then we start to take the pressure off of the countryside. Like, imagine if San Francisco produced 30% of its own fruits and vegetables. That then opens up space for the spinach growers and the strawberry growers to not just grow spinach and strawberries, to maybe have you know, heirloom varieties of wheat that do well in a foggy climate to do pasture-raised chickens or sustainably raised cattle. And so if cities become more self-sufficient, and that doesn't mean 100% self-sufficient, but as cities become more self-sufficient, it just lessens the slack. It makes it, and in lessening the slack, the slack in terms of fruit and vegetable and egg, and egg production, um, allows surrounding farmers to be more diversified, which is an ecological goal. Um, and then reduces the transport costs for, you know, again, it's hard to talk about food without mentioning Michael Paul, but Michael Paul makes a great point of how crazy, you know, the salad industry is, is that we're shipping water across the country. I mean, lettuce is mostly water. That's something that every household in this country can, can grow themselves. You know, the lettuce, the apple tree. I think it's so wonderful. You know, you stroll around Berkeley, Oakland, or, or parts of the South Bay and the older neighborhoods, and every house has got a fruit tree. I mean, that's just, that's just how you used to do it. That was common sense. Um, you put a couple of fruit trees in the backyard. And so these vestiges of that kind of ancient wisdom are still there. Um, I mean, I have a little bit of a bias on this one, but I, I do think the David Brower experience in revitalizing the Sierra Club, I, I think the revitalization of the Sierra Club going from, I mean, the Muir history is fascinating, right? I mean, going from essentially a backpacker's club Becoming a political organization in the fight over Hetch Hetchy. Hetch Hetchy, by all accounts, sort of breaking Muir's heart. And it depends how you kind of like Dickensian or Shakespearean you want to get about it. But then sort of dying because he's so heartbroken over what happens with Hetch Hetchy. After that political fight, basically again becoming a wilderness backpacking club until Brower and other folks come in in the 40s and, and revitalize it into a, into a political organization. And then the interesting schism then when Brower tries to go more radical, and more radical in like the truest sense, you know, looking at the root causes of things, um, starting to rethink his ideas around compromising about Diablo Canyon. Um, and so I think in that whole Sierra Club story, you see it's an interesting microcosm. And, and, and of course, because the Sierra Club's based in San Francisco and it's got such a, you know, um, a local sort of vibe about it and its history, but it's a microcosm, I think, for you know some of the ups and downs of the environmental movement in general. I think the interesting thing is, you know, my read on is is you know Brower kind of gets kicked out of the Sierra Club, but so many so much of Cold War politics were involved, right? Because he says, oh, let's have kind of one Earth, and in the 1960s that sounds like you know the Kremlin sneaking into the Green Movement or whatever. So, um, and so there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different things happening there. So I think. You know, the Sierra Club, you can understand a lot about not only Bay Area ecological history, but U.S., you know, environmental history through the experience of that organization. Um, I do think the growth of the CBEs and the West County Toxics Coalitions goes to show, is an example of the environmental movement starting to become uh, more cognizant of and committed to environmental justice and the, the unique needs um, and demands of fence line communities and what those those constituencies need. Um, and I think more, you know, more recently, um, you know, Van Jones coming out of this soil and then, and then saying, okay, we not, need to not just go beyond, okay, the needs of fence line communities, but communities of color in general, low income communities of color in general. How do we, uh, how do we ensure that this transition to a green economy benefits everyone? And of course, in the Van Jones story, you also see what I was talking about earlier, which is that reliance on business, right? This idea that, okay, yeah, government's going to play a role and the stimulus package is great and green stimulus is great, but it's not going to happen without business. So there's a, you know, when people ask me, the U.S. environmental movement is definitely, I think, a, it's a San Francisco, D.C. axis with maybe some stuff going on up in Seattle and Portland for sure, but it's very West Coast grounded, I think it's fair to say. Um, and so just looking at what happens in the Bay Area, you can get a sense of, I think, the U.S. environmental movement. Well, I mean, you know, there's Green Action um, and their work in holding uh, PG&E accountable. 
I, I would also, you know, have to say another national model for sure is People's Grocery. I mean, People's Grocery has been on the, or City Slicker Farms in Oakland. Um, again, you know, the urban farming scene is, you know, the urban farming movement is happening around the country, but some of the nationally recognized top models are here, you know, in, in Oakland. Um, and, you know, you just look at the way that People's Grocery kind of came in, I think, a little bit like in 2003, 2004, in kind of the ground floor of this revitalization of the food movement. And, of course, there's been a long-standing sustainable food movement, you know, again, going back to the back-to-the-land movement, and hippie-inspired movements in the 60s and 70s. But this kind of what I'd call the second wave, um, the more entrepreneurial wave, People's Grocery has been at the sharp end of the spear on that. So, uh, it was, it's, the, it's Abby who said that, you know, uh, growth for its own sake is the logic of the cancer cell. And that's just so apparent to me, right? There's nothing in nature that grows forever. Even, you know, you can go and be odd and have a mystical, you know, numinous experience with a redwood tree. And at some point it's going to turn back into duff, um, even though it's lived for 2,000 years. There's nothing on the planet that grows forever. And so I think actually that, I actually think growth is the number one wisdom we take from natural systems. Is this idea of recycling? Is this idea of death and renewal? Um, you know, death and renewal is called creative destruction if you go to business school. But there's, you know, another way to to look at it. And um, we are going to have to come to terms that growth for its own sake does not work and really try to try to answer for ourselves what is enough, um, what is sufficient for ourselves. I'm not sure. Like, I'm really not sure. But I think more and more people are asking the hard questions. I was really um, pleased to see just a couple of days ago uh, a wire story out of Brussels that the EU is considering dropping or not dropping, but not having GDP be its sole indicator of progress. Um, that would be a major move, you know. It's not. We're not just talking about Nepal now or Bhutan with their, you know, general happiness index. This is the EU we're talking about saying GDP is an insufficient measure for um, for human well-being. So, is there some other third way hybrid where? You know, I think the market is a decent way of setting the value of goods and services. Um, I don't think command economies have been shown to work very well, but I know that the underlying logic and assumptions of capitalism are going to have to be rethought. Or we're going to have to have, you know, maybe it's a market system without capitalism. And that means that, I mean, the reason why capitalism demands constant growth is because the banks need constant capital. And the banks need constant capital because they're, it's all on the float, Right. And so, you know, maybe do we have a market economy that's not capitalism, right? It's a market economy where the market, that is people in general, set the prices of goods and services depending upon their scarcity or abundance. But um, the, the, the means of sort of lending is different. You know, maybe we have to, I don't, you know, I think usury should be illegal, you know, so let's, Let's redefine what usury is. And anything above, you know, 2% a year is usury. I don't have any. My technology's fixed fantasies is the Neolithic Revolution. Um, I, you know, I'm really skeptical. There's this Columbia University or NYU professor who's all about vertical gardens. And again, I'm really optimistic about growing food in urban settings. But I think it's got to happen in the soil, in this little epidermis of the earth that sustained us for thousands of years. I'm really skeptical about even organic hydroponics, I don't think it pencils out in terms of the amount of energy you need. BTUs, a, a gallon of water weighs six pounds, okay? If you're growing all this food on the sides of buildings, you need a lot of energy to move water up to the 20th story, okay? Um, maybe there's other ways of doing it, and I would love to see those guys succeed, but I'm, I'm skeptical. I think part of that idea of living within our own means and, and um, challenging the idea of growth is... Realizing that there's not that many techno fixes. Um, there's, and there's ways to build a better mousetrap, for sure. I mean, I think that there's obviously a lot of improvements that can be made with solar technologies, with energy storage and battery technology need to be improved. Um, uh, I mean, I think energy is kind of the main thing right now, and transportation. But even in transportation, we figured it out pretty well, right? I mean, the bicycle works very well. The train works very well. You know, a friend of mine who, and this is kind of black humor, but, you know, if we were going to commit genocide against the Native Americans and exterminate the buffaloes for the railroads, we should have at least kept the railroads, right? 
Instead, we decided to, like, get rid of, you know? And so, talk about, like, planned obsolescence. Um, the, I, I think in transportation, a lot of the stuff was already there. Um, and I'm not, and I really am not, I don't have any, like, Mad Max ecotopia fantasies. You know, I think sometimes people will talk about hyper-localism. 2,000 years ago, the city of Rome imported its grain from Egypt. I mean, we're not going to become so um, closed in that we're not going to trade things. I mean, I'm going to still want to have coffee and bananas. And if I can find a fair trade organic co-op in Nicaragua to build links with and trade those things, that's awesome. Do we need people on the other side of the world making tchotchkes for the store shelves at Walgreens and making our own shoes? No. There's some things that it makes sense to trade, um, like perhaps lithium from Bolivia to make, you know, the batteries we need to store the energy from the windmills. Um, but I don't think it's we're we don't, we're not in a technical we're not in a technological predicament. We're in a social, cultural, political predicament, and most of the technology is there. And at the same time, I hope that the people who are looking to build the next generation of solar panels succeed. I don't know if there's setbacks. There's distractions. I mean, I think the environmental movement in the, you know, in Northern California, but kind of nationally, in some ways, NIMBYism is good, right? If every community said, we don't want a coal-fired power plant in our backyard, there'd be no coal-fired power plants, you know what I mean? So, in a sense, we want that kind of local autonomy to just say no. Um, that said, I think there sometimes are what you would call NIMBY, not in my backyard campaigns. Um, that can be distractions. I'm actually thinking, like, really right now, you know? It's like, okay, well, we can't go into the Mojave Desert and create solar thermal because we might displace, you know, X hundred acres. Well, if we don't do that, those X hundred acres are going to be displaced by global climate change. You know, there's got to be a little bit of seeing the forest for the trees. Um, or, you know, oh, we can't put up windmills on this thing because they're going to be my line of sight. Well, you know, that line of sight is going to be gone with climate change. So sort of having a sense of, um, you know, kind of like realism there about about that. Um, in general, again, I guess this gets back to my sort of sectarian or, or my, my tactical um, Catholicism that like sort of everything works. I'm having a hard time really thinking of something that's been too much of a distraction. Well, I think the hydrogen stuff, I mean, you know, thank God it must have been years ago now that Jeremy Refkin, you know, wrote his book about, you know, the hydrogen bubble. But, I mean, there's been some techno fixes for sure. I think there's been some techno fixes where we've gone down cul-de-sacs. I think hydrogen being an obvious one. Yeah. Doing Tom Turner. And Tom just seems to really understand the, the kind of history, ebbs and flows of, of the environmental movement really well. Um, and in that McKibben book, he did the he did like this chronology that accompanies it, which is really nice. I mean, another anecdote I just was thinking about this earlier. You know, the other kind of hot issue when I moved to the Bay Area was the fight over the Headwaters Forest. This is sort of pre-Julia going up in the tree, right? This is the major lockdowns kind of in the woods. I was working at the Guardian when that pepper spray scandal came out. Right? Remember, the people were like in the Mendocino County or Humboldt County Sheriff's Department. They were swabbing their eyeballs with pepper spray, um, and that was also sort of a an awakening experience for me and getting a sense of Bay Area, Greater Bay Area, Northern California environmental movements, um, as was energy deregulation. And probably some of my experience there was colored by my relationship to The Guardian. But by that time, I'd gone out to Martinez, and I remember writing like a big package of story, a big package of, a package of stories about energy deregulation for the Martinez News Gazette, which is probably like overly ambitious for that newspaper, right? I wrote these like huge things. Um, but I remember sort of the, uh, the disagreement over tactics and strategies there. A lot of people thought that NRDC and, not to name names, but Ralph Cavana most obviously, um, being the kind of the expert on that, had sort of sold, sold the movement down the river and that deregulation was not going to work out. And I think we've pretty much shown that it, it hasn't worked out the way that NRDC sold it. NRDC is going to be this huge boon for green energy. And I don't think California energy deregulation led to that. If anything, you know, California has been ahead of the curve. Or even, you know, it's really funny also. I mean, the thing you got to know about Bay Area environmentalism is how kind of lucky we are. People can convince about PG&E, but on, from a national standpoint, they're one of the best utilities in the country in terms of renewables. And that's because of mandates, you know, passed in Sacramento. 
not necessarily because of PG&E, but, you know, the Public Utilities Commission sets the rules and PG&E's got to follow them, and they do it pretty well. I mean, we're lucky that we have as much renewable as we have, um, you know, Diablo Canyon notwithstanding. You know, those, those were some other experiences that sort of I remember being really crucial. And definitely, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people still kicking around the scene that I know for whom, because I was just got here and was on a different track as a reporter, journalist, not necessarily as an activist, but a lot of peers, people I know my age, definitely cut their teeth in those headwaters fights. That was definitely a crucible for people who are now in their 30s, um, going up there, being involved in those mass actions. Um, and you got to remember, you know, that wasn't just a super radical Earth First crowd. They were getting mass numbers of people up to some of those demonstrations. Um, it wasn't, you know, 50 people on, on a line. It was like 500 people on a line. Another organization that kind of comes to mind in terms of this ebbs and flows is Rainforest Action Network. And, again, a, a national organization but with really strong Bay Area roots. Um, and an organization that I think does, and full disclosure here, you know, my girlfriend works there, but... Uh, that does a really good job of trying to play the different tactics and the different strategies, doing a decent job of doing both inside and outside, more on the outside thing for sure because of their willingness to do, um, you know, direct action, Greenpeace-style technical actions and banner hangs, but also um, does a very effective job at engaging with their targets, you know, has people who, are, who, are, who come from backgrounds in banking and law who can sit down with the corporate executives and talk to them on a peer-to-peer -peer level and then they have like the crusty you know dreadlock crew who are outside banging the door and and ran somehow manages i think better than a lot of other groups to engage with their adversaries while really you know keeping the heat on um and that, i think is an interesting story connie shadid is, is a former uh, brower youth award winner who works with ledge as a young african-american woman um I would say probably a little bit more of that does go down in Oakland, you know, looking at the Ella Baker Center or, um, you know, Green Jobs for All. Um, obviously, Henry Clark is is kind of a, a regular presence. Um, I think maybe talking to people at Poder, you know, and, and their campaigns are kind of classic economic justice, economic rights campaigns, immigrant rights campaigns, but they're starting to do more work around food security and diet. They run now a CSA there in cooperation with a um, woman-owned, Latina-owned farm. Um, Maria Inez Catalan and Catalan Farms uh, has, a, has a CSA drop-off at Poder. Um, boy, I haven't talked to her in years, but I'm sure she's doing something interesting. Renee Saucedo from La Raza Central Legal, you know, is definitely comes from an economic justice immigrant rights background, but has, I think, an intuitive understanding and this gets back to what I was saying earlier. Like, I think there's so many people who, because the limitations of our natural resources are becoming more and more obvious, because climate change is becoming more and more obvious, um, I do think it's fair to say that the ecological movement is part of the kind of broader progressive left in terms of looking at just justice. And when I think about people I know who I would think of as immigrant rights campaigners or social justice campaigners, but who I know is people is I know like you know personally they get it they get it in terms of they understand that the environment is a social justice issue and they might not identify themselves as environmentalists but they understand that um, l you know lack of access to fresh local healthy foods is a social injustice they get it that um, the geography of where factories and power plants and and uh, refineries end up is a social justice problem you know is a social justice issue. Um, so I do think that awareness is building. Oh, I'm going to put my hat back on before I fry here. The city is an urban overlay on natural systems. The facilities of a city uh, the, and the activities, uh, water, energy, food, etc., should be geared toward the natural systems that the urban area has been overlaid upon. Uh, this will be done. Uh, it, it will be done from necessity. Right now, it sounds a little um, a fairy tale ish that urban areas are in nature, but in fact, no development of the city in the future will be able to be done without accounting for these natural systems.
there's got to be a balance where you where you look at using the city to actually create the things that people need to survive as well as using it to create a a more flourishing democracy like people actually being involved in decision making and things that you know relate to what they what they need and then you know and then a connection between urban places to rural environments that do support us I really strongly believe on the value of local agriculture and the culture of local agriculture. And I don't care whether it's organic or commercial. Uh, it's really important for people to be connected to their food. It's very encouraging to see the food systems work that's come up. That's um, organic is so important, but it was never ever just organic that was going to solve, you know, the bigger picture. So that kind of food justice struggles that are there, alternative distribution systems, uh, an entire market and economy that's grown up around providing alternatives. Cities are never going to be food self-sufficient, right? We don't have enough land and space here um, to grow wheat for ourselves, much less pasture-raised goats. But what happens, again, by growing some of our food, not only do we, again, do we cultivate that ecological consciousness by getting people more uh, aware of their surroundings and our reliance on natural systems, but then we start to take the pressure off of the countryside. Like imagine if San Francisco produced 30% of its own fruits and vegetables. That then opens up space for the spinach growers and the strawberry growers to not just grow spinach and strawberries. If cities become more self-sufficient, and that doesn't mean 100% self-sufficient, but as cities become more self-sufficient, it just lessens the slack. We need to develop a suburban backyard farm movement, which is to say to take all of the lawns uh, in, in, that surround cities because, you know, you, you have a lot of roof gardens now growing food, but that can never begin to feed 2% of the people, you know. But there's a gigantic amount of basically unused land, land that is just growing grass, growing water consumptive grass. We really need to, to attack the whole fossil fuel problem. Um, the way we structure our energy use is inherently problematic um, and, and is, is becoming catastrophic. The problem with cities, it seems to me, is primarily the problem of cars. I mean, if you're in Copenhagen or Rome and uh, you see what a pedestrian area you know, can do in terms of the uh, quality of life in the city, you realize that this thing is really absurd. So the city you know, just has to deal with the car problem as the number one issue. If you've ever been in Manhattan when there's been a taxi strike, it can be marvelous because there's so many, you know, there's so few private cars and so many cabs, you know. Just the taxi strike in the city becomes, it becomes magical. So there's a growing interest in what's called low impact development, which says when you build something, you should try to, as much as possible, mimic the way water would naturally behave. It has tremendous benefits for clean water. It also happens to be more aesthetic. The more plants you use, the more you're sequestering carbon, which is something that we need to be doing. And it would have the effect of making our cities more generally permeable to wildlife. And in California, where we have water shortage issues, it's also how you recharge the groundwater. And my idea of of restoring a creek is doing as little as necessary to make it become natural and just let it happen. Picked up a copy of the Potrero View one day and saw on the front a picture of an egret flying over a freeway. And I had no, I didn't even know that the bird was called an egret, but I knew that it was something really neat that I sort of thought as being something that you went somewhere else to see. And to find out that it was in San Francisco really grabbed my imagination and my attention. Whenever you see in the paper that somebody saw a coyote in San Francisco, I jump up and yell, yay! It's, it's fascinating right now to see the um, coyotes coming back into the urban environment. Um, seeing these megafauna, um, these different kinds of critters just popping back up. It's a wonderful thing because urban environments tend to bleach those things out because they're scary, they don't fit, and we're trying to figure out a better way to fit, and I think that's very exciting work.
this is some people's favorite question. Uh, okay. Can there be ecological sanity in a world system based on growth? And you, or do you think growth could be redefined and replaced with something else? And can capitalism persist under another under another paradigm? Um. <laughs> answer to the initial question is obviously no. <laughs> we can't find ecological sustainability based on growth. Um, it's just illogical. The majority of the world is not benefiting from our system of growth. The system that we now have, which is global economics, global capitalism, global market economy, and so on, I think that's just a really failed, obsolete, um, absurd system and the absurdity of it is really well revealed now by the limitations of the planet, by, the, by climate change, by global resource depletion, water, forests, arable soil, fish in the seas, uh, key minerals and so on. That's all, the, the basis of industrial society and economic growth is over. I do not think that the current system is sustainable in any way, shape or form. I just know that what's happening is, is wrong and um, that we obviously can't keep on growing. It's just sort of intuitive, you know, you know, you, you can't do that. I think you have to redefine it. I, I think you can have economic health without growth. You have new products, you have, you have different way of delivering them. I mean, look at, well, we can get into a whole, I mean, we go on for hours, man. We need to have our work be integrated with the actual physical reality of, of the earth that we live on and the limited resources. Economic growth in a limited system simply doesn't, does not work, you know. So everybody goes and buys a Prius, come on, what? What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's going to solve the problem. I, I don't think that there can be ecological sanity in a system based on growth. There are ways to move forward that aren't growth, or there are ways to progress that are not growth. It's Abby who said that growth for its own sake is the logic of the cancer cell, and that's just so apparent to me, right? There's nothing in nature that grows forever. We need to find a steady state economy. The population is so big that if we were going to grow, I don't know where we could get the resources to grow. I think uh, a friend. Growth is a really horrible term. <laughs> I think it's a, a misconception. It represents a misconception of what's enjoyable for the human species. Clearly, economic growth is the model of our society, and it's completely antithetical to ecological sustainability. Sustainability is, you know, a steady state or even possibly regenerating the systems that exist and making them more productive over the long term. I actually think growth is the number one wisdom we take from natural systems. Is this idea of recycling, is this idea of death and renewal. The economy I think is over the long haul going to, as we understand it now, is going to continue to contract. More people are going to continue to lose their jobs. And what we think of as jobs and livelihood is going to go through a transition and we better start getting our heads around it quickly because people are hurting. The economy that's going to, that's going to be valid is, is kind of a um, participatory local small scale or regional economy where it's not about wages, it's really about participation in all economic processes. Livelihood in the future may look like a combination of part-time small-scale urban farmer in your backyard plus some barter work and some exchange work and maybe some part-time work driving a bus. You know, it might be a much more creative patchwork thing. Part of that idea of living within our own means and challenging the idea of growth is realizing that there's not that many techno fixes. We're not in a technological predicament. We're in a social, cultural, political predicament. There are so many areas that are uh, still unexplored for living together on the planet. There's so many programs and um, policies that are possible. Uh, it's really uh, a new world that way.
We've got war all wrong. The primary way that war kills is not with any weapons, but by wasting about $2 trillion a year globally on wars and primarily on preparations for wars. About $30 billion a year would end starvation on Earth. Another $11 billion provide the world clean water. A global investment in sustainable agriculture and green energy would begin to dent the military budget and to reduce the deaths caused by climate change. Don't get me wrong, war also kills with weapons. War rivals infectious disease as a cause of morbidity and mortality. 85 to 90 percent of the deaths are civilian by anyone's definition. The American Public Health Association calls militarism a public health threat. War is sporadic in human history, mostly absent from prehistory and unrecognizable in its current form from just a few centuries back. Intense conditioning is required and higher suicide rates result. There is nothing natural about war. And the first case of PTSD from war deprivation has yet to be discovered. War generates enemies rather than eliminating them. Nonviolent alternatives are more effective even against the most menacing evil. War is a top destroyer of the natural world. No other institution consumes remotely as much oil as the military. War is the basis for eliminating our civil liberties. Other spending and even tax cuts would create more jobs than military spending. There is no upside. As Benjamin Franklin said, there never was a good war or a bad peace.